Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining the Rotary Club of Silicon Andhra, the vocational services uh, webinar. Uh, we have a wonderful topic today. Uh, without any further delay, I would like to request our uh, co-chair, Vocational Services, Srini Tontagaru, to kindly introduce our speaker and uh, get the, um, uh, the presentation started, sir. Thank you, Srini Garu. Yeah, greetings, everybody. Uh, wonderful uh, Silicon Andri, uh, Andhra uh, Rotary Club family. Um, and thank you, Paul, uh, for your time uh, on a Sunday evening. So uh, just to uh, give a brief and, uh, and a humble introduction, um, you know, Paul Claxton um, is an awarded business leader and a, a previous uh, US Marine. And he spent uh, around 11 years on uh, active duty and already completed uh, four, uh, four total tours in Iraq. Uh, he's an entrepreneur uh, for more than four years uh, he has extensive uh, global experience, uh, you know, working uh, in multiple countries, so dealing with, uh, you know, multiple uh, countries like Middle East and Mexico, uh, Europe, USA, China, and Africa. Uh, he's also big time into uh, startups. Uh, he has uh, started and led two different bootstrap companies and taken them from conception to from almost, you know, like, you know, zero revenue to uh, 200k per annum revenue uh, within uh, very short durations. Uh, also has uh, very good experience uh, in, you know, like uh, working with, uh, you know, people uh, helping on venture capital and secured uh, well over several million uh, in the venture capital commitments. And also interestingly, um, he has, uh, you know, started uh, a master's uh, in the liberal arts program at Harvard Extension School. Um, and also, uh, he's also authoring uh, his first book, uh, which is titled um, uh, Building the Nucleus, uh, you know, that is buildingthenucleus.com. And uh, also, um, he's, uh, you know, in the, he, he was uh, basically, um, you know, setting up a nonprofit, uh, triple four start or, and I hope, uh, you know, that's probably, I know, uh, it's all approved by now, uh, because the last time I, I met, he mentioned about that. Uh, so he currently mentors uh, veterans on um, veterati.com uh, and also uh, previously you know worked at uh, various fortune 500 companies uh, staffing companies marketing agencies and you know like both bootstrap and high growth startups and then also uh, project management firms where um, he provides a lot of consulting services uh, uh, so yeah thanks to uh, paul again and also he's always available for us any uh, exclusive advisory services uh, where we would share the information uh, as part of the presentation shortly. Uh, welcome again, uh, Paul, uh, to Silicon Andhra uh, Rotary Club family. Uh, we value your time and, uh, you know, over to you. Thank you for having me. All right. So is the floor mine? Yes, Paul. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, thank you for having me so much. So today I'm going to be talking about the essentiality of technology and mastery to 21st century impact leadership as shown there in the title screen. So who am I? Uh, aside from the gracious introduction, um, I'll give uh, my version of, of who I am and why I'm here today. I am here today because I'm on a mission. I am good at what I do. Keyword, good. I said good, not perfect, not outstanding. Through the repetition of knowledge and, and re reliving my experiences by sharing them, I know that one of the many ways uh, that I can get better at what I do is by engaging uh, that knowledge and those experiences that I've had through my 20 year career. Uh, by engaging those uh, experiences and knowledge sets uh, with leaders like yourself in the business community. So I'm here today to pay that knowledge and those experiences forward and share my ideas, perspectives, uh, and experiences publicly through those transactional learning experiences, be those unstructured or structured, I can also learn from you and you can learn from me. I've replicated my uh, 
type of uh, perspectives in terms of um, how I view resilience and perseverance in terms of, of how a, a leader should incorporate that into um, their overall persona. I've incorporated that into my life and, and, and replicated that um, over the years, um, it, that re resilience and, and that perseverance uh, that I learned from the Marine Corps. And I turned that and translated that into the business world that leaders like you can rely on confidently. Uh, they say that business is war and they've even written books about this, like the art of war. Uh, well, I did four tours in Iraq, um, totaling almost three years in country. So I've been there. Um, I've noticed the many similarities in business uh, throughout my time in combat. Um, and the many similarities between uh, warfare and business uh, throughout my time in combat and in business. So I continue to put these, these teachings and these experiences uh, and, and these psychological principles and tactics that I've learned during, during my time. Uh, and I relay that knowledge uh, to business leaders like yourself that you can therefore take and make your own and apply uh, to your own life and, and uh, your, your own um, world of business and so forth. Um, all of this will help me continue to support the global business community and the consumer communities as, an international, as a thriving international entrepreneur, friend, brother, and partner. At the end of the day, I can achieve my mission by serving others uh, and by advancing society forward as well as improving people's lives through uh, my business endeavors, which is my ultimate goal. It's kind of like my uh, personal mantra. So that's why I'm here today. I mentioned before that business is war and, um, you know, Kevin O'Leary, I, I think we all know him from uh, Shark Tank. Um, he, he views business very seriously. He says, business is war, I go out there I want to kill the competitors and I want to make their lives miserable. I want to steal their market share and I want them to fear me. Now, how, how can you operate in business when you have animals like this walking around, right? Well, you partner with a guy like me, right? You partner with a Marine, someone who understands the concepts and the psycho psych psychological aspects of war as it might relate to business. Uh, during my time in the Marine Corps, um, I learned a, a lot of different uh, things in terms of um, you know, leadership, uh, in terms of dealing with ambiguity, volatility, and so forth, um, as it relates to um, you know, planning a mission out or planning a project, and then managing that project, managing the people and the dynamics that go along with it, and then dealing with the unforeseen changes that inevitably come along. And business is very much the same way. Combat's very much the same way. And so um, what I've been able to do, um, like I said, is kind of, um, you know, look at different ways that, um, those, that I can continue to replicate those experiences and, and pay that knowledge forward. Of the Fortune 500 companies, 163 of those CEOs are Marines. Most were enlisted Marines like myself. Moving forward, fortune telling is the future of leadership. So what does that mean uh, to, to you, if, if you were to think about it? Uh, well, what it means to me, and the reason why I came up with that quote uh, is because defining uh, great leadership in the 21st century, uh, it means that leaders must be able to uh, now predict the future, essentially. We have to be great fortune tellers. And by that, that means that you have to have a good grasp. As a leader, you have to have a good grasp on where the markets are trending, um, the dynamic changes that are happening in our society, not just from a demographic and social uh, social uh, social levels, uh, but also from political levels, and um, as well as how um, those changes are affecting the decisions that consumers make, that businesses make, and how ultimately how we engage new products and services. How are you going to react to that as an organization? How are you going to lead your organization through that? And so we have to be able to kind of see where the market is headed, you know? And, uh, you know, one thing is for sure is that um, when it comes to predicting the future, um, I, I'm not talking about it in the sense of, 
you know, predicting who you're going to marry or um, who, or, or essentially, um, you know, how long you will live or something like that. Um, but I'm talking about it in the sense of who are you going to be? You know, what type of business leader are you evolving into? Um, because one thing is for sure is that the market is constantly changing. So we have to constantly be changing with the market. What will your organization look like five to 10 years from now? Are you building for that now? Because it does take time uh, to build new products and services and uh, for the market to adapt to that, right? For that to become a trend, for that to become an industry standard, so to speak. So you have to build through that. Um, and really that starts now with kind of seeing where, where the market is at it. So we're going to talk more about that in, in some of the coming slides, but ultimately we need to be heretics and um, we need data for that. So moving forward to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about data. The past is not a great indicator of the future. Uh, why do I say that? Well, in, in, in terms of uh, providing uh, analogies, let's, let's just use a car as an example. When you go purchase a car from the dealership, it performs at optimum uh, condition, right? Uh, there's, there's no noises, there's, there's no creaks or anything like that, you know? The windows work, work right, everything works perfectly. And that's the beautiful thing about a brand new car. But as you begin to drive that car, as you begin to uh, use that car um, in different environments, different seasons, seasons you're going to start to notice that um, there are performance issues, glitches, and so forth. So the past is not a good perform or a good indicator of um, what the future is going to look like, right? Um, we can't judge the past performance on a car based on um, you know how how it's performed in the past. We can't use that as a barometer for gauging how it's going to perform in the future. And business is very much the same way. The market's very much the same way. So some of the things that we do need to look at, um, studies of the past is when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, being able to, to kind of foresee the future, right? And, and have a pretty good grasp or indication of what things will take place. Some of the things that we need to look at are um, studies. Studies have shown that analytics and um, data uh, are rarely accurate indicators of the future. So we need to rely on present data and analytics. And that's where um, things like quantum computing and machine learning come into play, right? Um, moving forward, psychology, that, that's a constant. Um, leaders of the future will have higher EQs versus IQ. And we'll talk more about that later as well. Awareness of possibilities. Um, against current trends, right? And so um, right now, you know, we have a lot of changes taking place um, and, and uh, with, re let's just say with, with the remote workforce, right? Because of COVID. And so that has created a whole new um, set of possibilities that we didn't see coming, but we knew it was coming. We knew this was coming. Um, it was just a matter of time. And now, businesses are building toward uh, to, to be uh, more of a um, environmentally conscious, um, socially conscious, but we have to build businesses to operate in um, um, safe, uh, ph physically safe environments, right? We have to take airborne diseases into consideration because this pandemic has ripped up the world and businesses were not uh, prepared for it. So we have we have to be aware of what the possibilities um, could be, uh, both positive and negative, in terms of um, you know how can you create new industries, but also what crisis um, unforeseen uh, might happen. It, could World War III possibly happen? Yes, it could very possibly happen. Um, there's a lot of tension between the U.S. and countries like China or North Korea and so forth. So you never know what's going to happen. And these are things that you need to be prepared for. And you, as a business leader, you really have to look at what, you know, those current economic and, and political and market trends are and be, and be able to use your resources um, and, and that data to be able uh, to, to kind of maneuver around that, right? Uh, moving forward, data is the new gold. 
data distribution to underserved communities is really going to be key. Um, Africa, believe it or not, is one of the uh, new emerging markets that it's, it's, that market is blowing up. And so the, the problem there though is, is that like the majority of the population, um, uh, much of the population lives in um, underserved communities. You know, what resources are going untapped in Africa that business leaders could potentially, um, you know, could potentially cultivate that would benefit mass numbers of society in other countries or markets in, in other countries and so forth. Um, what do we not know that, um, that we have not um, re researched or you know, what parts of the world have uh, gone untapped in, in terms of exploration, right? Um, so we need to, to be able to you know, get this technology into the hands of the underserved markets so that they can properly um, you know, go and navigate new resources that are gonna move society forward. Um, and that's very important. Um, development of those third world countries and underserved communities is very important um, for the future of our economy and the future of the world uh, and just being able to sustain life on planet earth. Uh, big data is big minds. So when you think about big data, what, what is big data? Most of us probably think of a computer or uh, a phone like this, um, but big data is just a bunch of information. Big data is a stack, it, it could be a stack of a million printout sheets uh, when you, but it's, it's nothing, the concept of big data is nothing more than when you just group data together and you make deferred and informed, uh, inferred uh, decisions and um, off of that data, deferred and inferred, inferred decisions, right? So powers of deduction and, and, uh, and so forth. And you build and you make calculated decisions off of that data. So you have, then you have big data. Uh, we've always had big data. We have not always had the right vision, business models, or nor have we all, always asked the right questions. The data is in our minds. So our minds are big data. So the idea is how can we make uh, essentially the, the car uh, better, faster, and more efficient? How, how can we make the car better, faster, and more efficient? The car in metaphorical terms being our economy. Once we realize that there is room uh, for value and improvement, then and only then can we, uh, you know, add parts onto that car that give it more horsepower, torque, uh, features, more navigational ability, and so forth. And then we start to create something better. And that's the same thing with our society. And until we understand from a data standpoint, we can't make our society more efficient. And that is why big data is so so important to the future of organizations, economies, markets, governments, and ultimately just development of leaders. Leaders are the future. Leaders of the future are master creators. I, I don't know if anyone has heard of uh, leadership management exchange theory or the vertical dyad policy. Uh, um, well, what I would call a fallacy, but the vertical dyad concept, right? The vertical dyad uh, concept basically says that you have two groups. So you have your in-group and you have your out-group. Well, the thing is, is that most organizations um, are built on this. Um, the separation of social classes has existed for almost 3,000 years, and it still runs pervasive, pervasively and rampantly in organizations. But we have to move away from that vertical dyad because it's becoming a fallacy uh, where you have quotes like, don't outshine your boss, right? Everyone is a leader. And I believe that personally, um, you know, if, if you're in an organization or a situation where you can't lead or, or you're, um, you're inhibited from leading or um, being able to share your ideas or um, being able to, to do, do your job efficiently, um, perhaps because uh, you work in a threatening environment, then you need to lead or you need to leave. So move, moving forward um, on, the vertical, on the vertical dyad uh, fallacy, you know, I'm going to start with a story. 
I used to work at a multi-billion dollar company that had some serious, serious organizational challenges, issues with management. Um, they had had a they they had a um, uh, leadership issues from all the way from my division all, all to, towards their um, um, corporate headquarters in Michigan, right? And so I was good at my job, um, but I was not what you would consider a good employee. As in, I didn't drink that corporate Kool-Aid. I bucked the system. One quarter, my seals alone covered the entire budget, not just for my IT division, but also the other uh, division in healthcare. And so I found myself in this position where, um, you know, I was becoming an outsider and I don't think my organization knew quite what to do with me because I was performing at a high level, but I also was not allowed to, to lead. You know, I wasn't drinking that Kool-Aid. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't essentially, you know, um, acting as if everything was okay. Um, and that's, this exists in a lot of organizations where, um, you know, they basically tell you, let's sugarcoat things, you know, and act like, you know, it's, it's, it, there's the, let's, let's act like the, the elephant is not in the room, right? When, you know, it clearly is. And pretty soon that elephant starts dancing around and he destroys your whole house. And, and that's kind of what was happening in this organization. Um, so eventually, you know, I had a colleague come up to me and he said, you know, we, we really like, we all want to keep our jobs <laughs> and you're putting us in the spotlight. And so it was, it was at that point in time that I realized I need to lead or leave. And uh, so, so, I, so I left, you know, and it, it, the problem was me. It, it wasn't the, the organization. The organization had been around since the 1940s. Um, I came around, you know, looking for a job and I, I got hired, but I can't reinvent the wheel to, to an organization that is persistent on being a certain way. It's, it's almost kind of like sticking your finger in the lion's den, right? If, if, if you stick your finger in the lion's den and the lion bites it off, is it the lion's fault? No, it's, it's your fault. So we really need to, as leaders, we really need to, to, to focus on doing self-reflection and uh, just self-analysis to, to see if, if you know, our vision, our personal vision, our mantra, why are we here? You know, why, why are we doing this? What are our goals? What are we expecting to get out of it? Does that fit the organization, right? Um, because otherwise, you know, if, if our personal mantra, our, our personal goals and, uh, you know, what we're trying to, to, to do out of our, um, what we're trying to accomplish in our life, if it doesn't align with the organization, then uh, essentially we can really never evolve in, into uh, full-fledged leaders. So, so I ended up leaving. Um, and I'll give you one, uh, one more analogy on that. Um, imagine you're in an auditorium, right? And you're, you're at your uh, company's annual corporate, corporate conference, and there are 5,000 people who work at your company. All of them are in the audience. You're sitting next to your boss in, in the row. You're, you're sitting next to your boss. He is sitting next to his boss, and you're all listening to a keynote speaker address the audience. Now, maybe you're not fond of each other. Um, you know, maybe uh, perhaps, you know, you've had some disagreements in the past. Um, you know, his boss is fond of you, though, but you're not fond of your boss and um, he's not fond of you. But one removed, so you have three people. So you have yourself and then one above you and then another boss above you and, and that his boss likes you. Right. So I think you, if, if you're following me. And so um, the keynote speaker asked, will all the leaders in my organization stand up and make their way to the stage? Would you get up and walk to the stage? Most people would not because they're, they're too, they, they don't want to outshine their boss. Um, you know, they don't want to, uh, you know, they don't know if it's their place. They don't want to step out. They don't want to lose their job. They just want to kind of stay in their cocoon and just, you know, let me just work nine to five and, you know, I'll do the bare minimum just enough to keep my job. And therein lies the problem 
that starts in adolescence when we're told no, we're constantly told no, and it follows us throughout our lives. And therefore, and that's why you have organizations that lack ideas, innovation, they're stagnant, you know, people don't like working there. And that is why we need to empower leadership at all levels at the creation level. Um, and, and we really need to change this, this culture, this, this um, outdated model of, of uh, uh, essentially what I said, you know, the, the vertical diet, you know, which is two groups. You have your in group and then your out group. The out group never gets anything done. That's the high turnover in organization. Then you have your in group that, you know, maybe they have the same interests as their boss. Um, they might not even be high performers. Um, they just may fit demographically or culturally um, or from a personality standpoint and they climb the ladder. And then the people in the, the out group, they get frustrated and they go to another company. And the process starts all over again because most companies, generally speaking, have some very some of the very similar issues. Uh, so that's that's one thing that we as, as leaders need to really think about how we're addressing or if we're even addressing it. Moving forward, the core tenants to a, a creation um, economy, a creation of society, the old way won't work. So what are the core tenants? The core tenants are innovation, arbitrage, international or international uh, management and contracting, right? Data distribution and uh, content, education, uh, jobs and new resources, new products and services, uh, unconventional learning, uh, technology and people. So you gotta have all that to create. Um, the ratio of intangible to tangible assets um, has, has flipped in, in the years, um, in the last 50 or so years, it's been, it's been flipping the other way in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 50 years ago, more businesses um, had, most businesses had tangible assets. Um, you walk into a company and you have a whole floor full of file cabinets. You don't see that today. Um, everything is IP, everything is online, everything is content, right? And, and especially uh, due to COVID this year, um, that's even, it, it's even uh, been exacer exacerbated and accelerated towards intangible assets. So the, the level of content in our, in our work environments are increasing tenfold. Um, so we have to change our business management styles up around that because we're undergoing a, a major uh, transfer, transformation. Uh, the competition is further, furthermore in, intensifying between individuals and companies. Um, you know, knowledge will be a key tribute uh, to be able to supply um, what is becoming more, more and more of a niche uh, society. Uh, so we have to, we have to start really engaging people, um, not just at the human level, but at the adolescent level. And we need to start building leaders of tomorrow today, uh, which means that, you know, mentorship, uh, education, unstructured learning opportunities, helping people. Um, you know, acquire more experience, learning through new experiences is really key. You can do a lot of that through networking. I'm an avid networker, um, but you can also do a lot of that through number two, arbitrage and international management contracting, which I do in my own business. I'm currently in Belfast, United Kingdom. Obviously I'm from the US, but I've been in Belfast the last uh, almost a year now. And the importance of building relationships and networking and doing business in different markets is huge. It's huge to the global economy. It's huge to the prosperity of uh, just mankind in general. Um, you know, I've got companies that I'm helping take uh, my business is helping them distribute and set up operations in the U S you know, because they're not, it's a different culture. You have high context and low context cultures, you know, you're, you're not, um, that business may not be privy uh, or um, prone to the nature of business um, in a particular country. So it can be beneficial for that organization to expand quickly by having a, or another um, company partner with them and, and help them uh, manage and set up those operations it can be very beneficial. Um, and that's, that's another thing that you know, I've seen, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, I had someone tell me the other day, 
I said, you know, well, what are you, what are you doing in the U.S.? Uh, because I, I'd seen that he had a, a business presentation. He said, you know, they had clients in the U.S. and whatnot. I said, well, what are you doing over there? Because this, this person is, um, he, he's in like uh, Eastern Europe. And he said, well, you know, we've kind of backed off on the U.S. market uh, because of COVID. And I, I just, me personally, like I, I would never back off. Like uh, Warren Buffett says, when others are greedy, be fearful. When others are fearful, be greedy. People are very fearful right now because of COVID. They're risk averse. And that, that's a problem. I, I would be all over that, you know. Uh, so I, I would never back off. I, I would have taken an opportunity to exploit the U.S. market even further because people are backing out of it. But, uh, I mean, that's his business decision. So, um, you know, everybody has to, um, to kind of, you know, do what they feel is best. But personally, me, um, you know, I, I go into things with a bull approach. Um, you know, kind of head first and, and I go hard. Um, and, and, you know, I believe that that's really the only way to do business is, is to fight hard. Um, maybe that's the Marine in me, <laughs> but uh, going on to the next slide here. So the, again, the old way will never work, which is why we must innovate. So I, this is a concept of mine called uh, perpetual velocity. And um, so perpetual velocity is I think I might have skipped a slide here. Oh, maybe I didn't. Sorry. Okay. No, perpetual velocity is a concept of mine um, that I came up with, which is basically a twist on uh, terminal velocity. And so if we're all familiar with the, the concept of terminal velocity, it means basically when you drop an object to the ground, gravity pulls it down, reaches its max speed at some point, right? The fastest a human can fall from the sky is 100, about 120 miles an hour. Perpetual velocity is a twist on that, which means that we all start at zero on the Cartesian coordinate uh, X, Y axis, right? Which is what you see there. Before zero, there's quadrants two and quadrant three. Quadrant two is in the positive, right? That's in the positive area before zero. Quadrant three is in the negative area. Some of us are born in the quadrant environments like quadrant two, where it's, it's almost like a utopia um, you know, we went to a great school, perfect education. Um, you know, maybe our family had lots of money. Uh, dad and mom stayed, stayed together. They were never divorced, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't really exist today because there's too many options. So people, people, um, they're more fickle, so to speak. The environment's more fickle. Uh, so most people today are not born into that quadrant two. They're born in somewhere in the quadrant three. But when we get to zero and then we're actually, when we're actually born into that environment, it's, it's up to us where we go. Do we stay on the positive side or do we, do we go down in the quadrant four on the, on the negative side? And this, this concept can be attributed to uh, companies and constant innovation as well in terms of you must always innovate because it, if you expect to continue accelerating as a company, then you have to keep innovating. You have to keep, uh, as a leader, you have to keep your uh, company adapting to change, which means that, um, you know, if, if you're doing that, then you should be able to continue on an upward trajectory. So upwards and forward, right? You want to keep going up, not down. But if you're not constantly innovating, if, if you're reactive to change, you're always behind the power curve, you're stagnant, you're, you know, this and that, um, you know, you're not going to take your company where it needs to go, where it wants to go. You're not going to take your people where, where they need to go to grow. Uh, stagnant objects don't grow, right? Um, it, you, you need, essentially, you got to move, right? If, if you sit in a, um, I mean, I've, I've read stories about people in captivity. They, they were cooped up in a, in a cell. They couldn't move. And their muscles atrophy. Businesses are very much like the same way. So, you have to keep innovating and adapting to change because that, that uh, axis there, that horizontal axis is time and it's constant. It's never going to stop. So, you know, you can't stop time. So either you can, um, you can kind of move ahead of it, essentially fortune tell, what I call fortune telling. You can either move ahead of it 
or you can stay behind the power curve and you can fall in the quadrant four, which is the negative quadrant. Uh, enemies of perpetual flight, some of the things I mentioned, too many options, complacency, lack of resources, wrong attitudes, risk averse, enemies of perpetual time, complacency, poor priorities, you waste time, uh, lack of execution leading to missed opportunities, lack of resilience, uh, delusion and illusion of time leading to ignorance which is part of the problem, you know, we, we think that we have all this time and we, we don't, it, it, it moves so unbelievably fast and we have to seize the moment and society is moving faster than really we can even keep up uh, with it. It's, it's almost moving faster than the concept of time in, in a theor theoretical stamp, uh, sense. Moving forward to the next slide. Uh, creating the, the four key components to a business um, means that, you know, you kind of have to, so when you're creating, you got to build around these things. Uh, so the, the, this is what I call the, the uh, key components to business in um, terms of staying in line of perpetual velocity, and, right, on, on the upward forward uh, trajectory. You got to have networking and relationships. You got to be an avid networker and multiple cultures, high context and low context. Because if you're, if let's say you live in LA, if you're only networking in LA, well, the LA market only does so many things. It's, they're big on tourism, you know, um, they're a big port city, you know, import and export trade. But outside of that, let's say you're in the car industry. LA is not really a big car industry market. Maybe you should go network in Detroit, you know, because that's, that's a big car industry market, right? And so you gotta be um, almost kind of market uh, geographic agnostic, industry agnostic, so to speak, but you gotta hone down on the technology areas. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. A um, few of the other uh, key components, sales and marketing, you gotta have sales, you gotta have marketing. Um, businesses that don't do marketing, I, I just, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, number three, you got to have people to maintain those, those um, sales. So you got to have a man, where are you going to get your people from? You're going to near shore, all shore, outsource, you're going to hire in, in house. How are you going to get your manpower? Cause you got to have people, no matter how much technology we have, you got to have people. Number four, you got to have a finance and legal strategy. My first year in business as an entrepreneur, I, I had, I had a client that didn't, he, he didn't want to pay me money. I had to take him to court and he paid me. You know, we settled at mediation, but the thing is, is that you're going to have people that are going to try to, they're going to try to, you know, cut you short and they're going to try to just to save a buck or to, or to make a buck um, because they think they can. So you got to have a, a finance and legal strategy. You don't want to be um, the CEO shouldn't be going out buying Ferraris. If you're a startup, you know, um, you, you got to, you, you can't be doing stuff like that. I know too many stories about companies that have um, skimmed the books, misappropriated their money, and you know they're out of business or some people went to jail and so forth. And you don't want that to be you. So you wanna have control of that. Um, you know, if, if you're gonna outsource your finance, outsource it, have someone else handle it, but also have someone in-house, at least one person to oversee that outsource finance. Number five, you gotta have technology. So, um, you, you got to have a web presence online. The first people place people go to look for you is, is online. You know, even McDonald's, it, people know who McDonald's is. Even people go look, look up McDonald's online based on the location. Is, is this a good McDonald's to go to or should I go to the other one? You know, based on the quality of service. So even McDonald's gets checked out online. Uh, moving forward. Uh, the future is VUCA. What's VUCA? Volatility, complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. Well, why, why would those be um, important to a leader? Well, a leader should be um, considering these things because, you know, VUCA has always existed, but because the world is moving at such a, a, a much quicker pace of, um, ir of irreversible change, um, these things are uh, even more, um, they're even more obvious, so to speak, uh, than they have been in the past. 
so we have to look in terms of volatility, the time that it takes to create, uh, send and acquire information happens at warp speed than it did 10 years ago. You can miss your opportunity just that quickly. Um, I've got people that I know that are building apps, phone apps. Um, th th there's some statistic out there. It says phones won't even exist. And, and like by 2025, phones will not even exist. So, you know, and you're, you're out here building a phone app, you know, Apple, uh, Android, you know, all the companies make Android, Samsung, et cetera, they can put you out of business like that. So, you know, the thing is, is that it is very, your window of time is very short. And that's, that's why we really got to be thinking, okay, how am I going to build something that can last 10, 20, 30 years? You know, how, how can I build something around that? so to speak, instead of just kind of being reactive. Um, complexity, there's, there's more, we have more options, which makes it tougher for leaders. You know, I've always said that, you know, you can, there, there's, there's a hundred, there, there's a hundred different ways to do something. If there are a hundred different ways to do something, then choose one of them because there, there's 99 other ways that, you can go through, you can analyze them, um, but you're gonna spend all that time trying to find the one perfect one. Just just do one, choose one, and then move forward on it. Um, so there, there are a hundred different ways to do something, but only one of them is gonna be right. And you, you don't wanna have to spend time going through 99 different options and just to make it a decision, right? I mean, I've had people spend hours on, on things that just don't make money. Um, you got to get your business moving forward. Uh, uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, once again, data can help with that. The importance of cybersecurity and multi-market data can help us deal with that ambiguity and, and uncertainty. Um, and so in order to understand and reduce VUCA, uh, we must look at the crisis affecting our world at global scale. And that's where we get into things like the, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations and you can see a list of all these crises. The sustainable development goals are, are a blueprint to achieving a better world. That is why they're so important. Not only that, for networking, just in terms of building relationships with people in different countries, policy leaders, um, to okay. combat some of the stuff. We can leave in a bit, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, get ready. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, oh, so, please continue, Paul. That was, uh, yeah, I side talk yeah. unintended here. Yeah. So, so the sustainable goals and the um, the World Economic Forum, those those, there's a reason why world leaders have have put these things on the list of uh, target areas that that we need to be looking at. So um, that that is very important to the future of. Um, of us, of our society to achieve a more sustainable future. Um, and, and we're moving from a consumption society to a sustainment society. So <clears throat> we're not building products uh, necessarily to consume anymore. We're building to sustain. Um, in, in the previous, in the manufacturing societies of the 20th century, we built to consume, but we're consuming it too fast of a rate now. We need to focus on sustainment. Facts on uh, why some, some of these goals are so important. Um, did you know there, there's a new birth every half second? There's a new consumer every quarter of a second. We're living longer. Earth's history is compared to a calendar year. Modern human life has existed for 37 minutes. We've already used one third of Earth's resources, natural resources in the last quarter of a second, in the last 0.2 seconds. The, According to, um, according to uh, the world clock counter, we have 29 years and 17 days of time left until the world ends as we know it with the possible collapse of Earth's current support systems and resources. Now, just think about that. I'm, I'm 39. In my lifetime, one more, just one more of my lifetime, that um, 30 more years, you know, the, I, I can remember back to when I was a kid in the 80s, you know, 30 years is not a long time. So we really have to, to start 
looking as leaders on you know how we're going to reverse and, and mitigate some of this resource utilization that we're just we're consuming at too high rates. Um, 19 years and seven days, we'll be out of fresh water. Depletion of natural resources uh, is faster than we can consume natural light, air, water, plants, animals, and so forth. Um, Aubrey de Grey said uh, the world, the world's first person that um, has already been the the um, person who will live to to a thousand years has already been born. So the first person to live to a thousand years has already been born, according to to his research and what he knows about um, you know biomedical and and, and genomics. Uh, that's that's his his per prediction. Um, but regardless of whether that person lives to a thousand years, we are living longer thanks to stem cell research and genomics and research science, um, robotics, you know, things like that, that, that can be implanted into our body by bio, bioelectronic devices. It's helping us live healthier lives. We have more data now about um, uh, our physiology. Uh, that, I mean, we created a vaccine in nine months. They're, they're releasing a vaccine for COVID. So we are living longer. Um, we're, the population's not shrinking anytime soon. So these are things that we need to address. And it's very important for business leaders to think about how they're going to do it. Um, we need to take technology as a way to address these things and, and kind of build our creation and our mastery of technology around things like these sustainable development goals, right? And some of the things that I've already talked about. I've highlighted in bold what I feel are some of the most important uh, artificial intelligence, big data, robots, cybersecurity, advanced materials, just to name a few. I think some of those are important, but ultimately you can just choose one and you know build, build a business model around that and make the world a better place, advance society for it and improve people's lives, make businesses more efficient, um, you know, where you can provide services in a certain category. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I've done in my own business. I, I run a global innovation management consulting firm and um, we focus on robotics. Uh, my firm is a board advisor to a venture capital robotics fund. We focus on robotics, uh, AR and VR as well as uh, smart technologies like IOT and so forth. And we've even got a budding um, healthcare vertical that, that's starting to emerge as well. So, um, you know, I think those are, th those should be keys for businesses to, to really think and research about what all these different emerging technologies mean and what their applicability is um, or might be in different areas. A super society is coming. The future is very bright for us. Um, in the future, we'll definitely, I think we'll definitely have um, more food, more time, less crime, disease, less disease, uh, less car accidents. Uh, so this is a big industry in terms of, um, you know, in terms of uh, building smart cities, right? That's, that's the new thing. Um, building smart cities, everything is smart, right? So when you think about um, new um, technologies or, or just even products that you use um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything can have some sort of technology uh, implemented into it. Uh, for example, this pen here could be a piece of technology. This could have some sort of embedded IoT on it that tells me when my ink is running low. You know, it could tell me when I need to go get a new pen. Hey, your ink is down to 10% uh, or you only have um, you only have, you know, like three hours of writing life or something left on your pen, but this, this could be a piece of technology right here. Very much so. Moving forward, human, uh, humans and relevance is uh, key to effective leadership. Um, we really, from a social uh, economic standpoint and a, uh, in a, um, a, a position of demographics, we got to really look at, at how we're addressing Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have to look at this. Um, there's been too many things that have happened um, this year. You know, George Floyd, uh, I, you know, I mean, that took the world by storm, but it was all due to poor, poor leadership. We have enough technology and social ingenuity to combat this stuff, to prevent this stuff from happening, to change the way organizations are run. 
so that things like that don't happen. And that is why the sustainable development goals in the World Economic uh, uh, Forum's uh, crisis list are, are so important for businesses to take a look at, for communities to take a look at. The change must be implemented before it happens or we will have more of this. True change starts with each and every one of us. Every person is a leader in your company all the way to the president focusing on executable and solution-based actions that can help others. And that, that is the truth. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, uh, in 2011, I had a car accident. I totaled my car and I, I called my boss uh, literally like two hours after, um, the, after they, the tow truck came and you know I was dealing with the police, et cetera, et cetera. I got back home and I, I called my boss. I'm like, look, I'm on the phone with my insurance company. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna make it into work today uh, because I have to get a rental car, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm dealing with all of this. Um, and they told me, well, just get back to work as soon as you can. Uh, usually those insurance companies are pretty quick uh, and they can have a rental car turned around to you um, within a matter of like half an hour to an hour. I was like, wow, I, I couldn't believe my boss had said that I was like, he really doesn't care about me. He just, he just wants me to come into work and, and just, you know, be like a robot. Like, I mean, there's no, there's no caring there. Where, where does, where does Maslow's hierarchy of needs come into? So right then and there, I kind of viewed my boss differently. I viewed that place of work, just, I viewed it a lot differently. I'm like, well, they don't really care too much about me. It doesn't seem like. Um, and so I, I ended up leaving eventually. I'm glad I did. Moving forward, uh, leadership mastery in the future is mainly soft skills based. Um, you have a list of soft skills here uh, that are very important um, to the future of leadership. Uh, you know, things like collaboration, feedback. You know, I've, I, in business, I've got people that don't follow through. I mean, that's just human nature, right? Um, I've got people that say that they're going to do stuff and then, you know, they go dark, you can't reach them, you know? Um, you know, that's, collaboration is key. That's, and technology has caused some of that because it's made us more impersonal, you know? Um, it, when I was growing up, I used to be able to, we, we would just show up at people's homes, you know, because that was the thing to do and just drop by and say hi. But if you were to do that today, it, it might be offensive, people would, wonder what's wrong with you why didn't you call me or text me first but it's it's these changes you know the social media and so forth that um causes us to not interact with each other face to face it's and it replaces that face to face communication so we're losing we're losing touch with each other um as humans and as leaders we have to address that um, some quotes that I came up with here, uh, the best leaders are not hiding in a cocoon somewhere. They're out there and about. Um, people can be your uh, greatest asset or your greatest liability. Unfortunately, most organizations view people as liabilities, not as assets on a balance sheet, which is the problem many organizations face. From an accounting standpoint, you do have to measure <clears throat> assets against liabilities, both intangible and tangible. Um, based on what you own, right? And the thing is, is that that's, that's good from an accounting standpoint, but from a, um, a people standpoint and just being able to, to connect with people on an emotional level, we have to stop doing them as, um, as not, not as assets, right? Um, because ultimately without them, we would not have our, our business. We, we need people to, to be able to run and scale our business. So that is, that is my presentation. Uh, if you would like to reach me, you, you can reach me at the following, paulc at reciprocityroi.com. And uh, for business inquiries, you can reach me at uh, reciprocityroi.com or connect with me on my CV uh, uh, for mentoring or public speaking opportunities at bambusinesses.com. Uh, you've got a business partner for life if we connect. Um, I believe that we went together and um, yeah. So thank you for having me and, and I appreciate you uh, listening to me.
Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. A lot of information and uh, uh, wonderful, you know, several things, you know, which are very appropriate for the times that we are in. Thank you for sharing all your thoughts and your experience. Uh, are there any, um, uh, you know, do you have a few minutes for any questions if anybody is interested? Of course. Okay, great. Uh, hi. Um, anybody has any questions, please unmute yourself or you can type in in the chat. Yeah, Paul, uh, great session actually. The concept of perpetual veracity. Definitely I'll try to look into that more. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, Paul, if you may, you know, stop the share screen, then we can see everybody, you know, on the on the video here. Sure. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, thank you for that comment, Srinagar. Anybody has any further uh, any questions or anything that you want to uh, talk about? Purnagar, go ahead, sir. Yeah, uh, Paul. Uh, the thing is that about the population. My guess is that population growth in a semi long term is not an issue. Actually, in all advanced countries, the growth is going down, right? So much so it is even negative growth in Scandinavian countries. As the society gets more sophisticated, even in Africa and Asia, those numbers will go down. Eventually, our issue isn't about uh, population growth, I think. And, we're, uh, and it might come a day when actually you have to give some incentives for population. That's my impression, but you have spoken, you spoke very well. well. I think you covered very depth and uh, very appreciate you uh, for, uh, for a old guard like me. It's very inspirational. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, as, it come, as it relates to population growth, um, one of the things that we have to look at is the, the survivability, right? Um, whether the population goes up or down is in, you know, in terms of crowded cities, um, we're becoming more and more urbanized um, because the, the consolidation of population will also help dependency on uh, reduce dependency on resources um, and being able to have these smart kind of urban uh, urbanized cities or uh, large colonies, so to speak, or metropolitan areas. Um, so it's it, one of the things is, is like, key, um, uh, one of the key factors is uh, overcrowding in cities, right? Um, and so that, that's, that's a, a battle on its own, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, in terms of population growth, it, it is something that um, we should keep an eye on for sure. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, very, very nice uh, um, and uh, informative session today. A uh, lot of knowledge, actually. No, um, wonderful uh, uh, thought process went through. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, your fabulous experience sharing with us. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Sure. OK, okay. Uh, we can probably take one more question, if anybody has it, before we concluding. Okay. Okay. No further questions. So, so thank you again, Paul. Thank you. You are doing a wonderful job, and uh, we wish you all the best. You know, with all your business endeavors, and uh, we hope we hope to see you again sometime, maybe post COVID times, uh, somewhere, yes. in and then you know, uh, get to have a coffee or uh, a lunch together. And uh, thank you for uh, joining this, uh, you know, Rotary Club of Silicon Andhra Vocational Services. Uh, you know. Uh, track today and then helping us you know uh, take uh, us through uh, you know your experience uh, really wonderful thank you appreciate yeah, it yeah thank you for having me